Peace up, A-Town Down. I'm Sam Arano, and this is the recap video from my special on the Jewish history of Scandinavia, in which I talk about the things I left out of the videos, correct mistakes that I made in the videos, and answer questions from Gaon and Navi-level patrons on Patreon. Before going forward, I want to address something from the previous recap. In that video, I tried to answer the question of why John Monash isn't better known, either worldwide or in his native Australia, only to realize, after the fact, two major reasons that I actually knew about but hadn't really thought of in this specific context. First of all, I expressed some confusion as to why the Australian educational system is so inept at teaching its own history, but in retrospect, it's pretty clear that this is a lingering consequence of what I've sometimes heard called the cringe. Basically, until after World War II, education in Australia was extremely Anglo-centric. So instead of learning about Mount Kosciuszko in geography class, you learned about Ben Nevis, the tallest mountain in Britain, even though it's way shorter and on the other side of the planet. The same applied to learning history, and it's pretty clear to me that this originated from Australia's origins as a convict colony, which for a very long time was basically taboo to even talk about. I think that's silly, but it is what it is. And while John Monash wasn't a descendant of convicts, as a mostly pre-independence figure, I suspect he kinda gets lost in the shuffle. As to why he isn't more famous internationally, in addition to everything I already said, there's the issue that credit for his advances in modern warfare strategy was stolen by the Nazis, specifically Heinz Guderian, a full 20 years after the fact and nine years after Monash died. Like I said in the 100 Days video, Monash was a little too far ahead of his time, and that had always been the case. Uh, he was one of the first people ever to consider the role of fixed-wing aircraft in warfare. And when it came to the First World War, a lot of his most ambitious ideas were built around technology that wasn't quite there yet, like tanks not being fast enough. So Guderian was able to take credit by putting those more advanced ideas into practice in 1939. And the Nazis, who believed Jews were incapable of invention and could only steal other people's ideas, stole ideas from a Jewish general, true to form. So on to Scandinavia. In this video, I mentioned that a majority of politicians in the Swedish Riksdag supported Jewish emancipation as early as 1847, but were unable to pass it. What will almost certainly be a running theme in this recap is that these types of specials, which cover such a long span of history, really have to be cut down for the sake of pace and comprehensibility. I mean, that's true for all of my videos, but it's especially true of these. So I end up with situations like this, where I mention something offhand that would normally warrant more context in one of my main videos, one of my non-specials, but there just isn't time. Luckily, that's what these recaps are for, and since the Nordic viewers really came out for this video, lots of people were happy to bring additional info, including for this. Commenter Alexandra Bringelson writes, Just to be clear, in 1847 Sweden still had the estate Riksdag system. But unlike on the continent, we had four estates, priests, nobles, peasants, and the bourgeoisie. So for any major change, any estate could veto it. That's why they needed the support of the peasants' estate. The estate Riksdag was abolished in 1866 and replaced with a bicameral system, and the bicameral system was replaced in 1971 with a unicameral Riksdag. Another casualty of the special format was Henrik Wegerland. He was a playwright and a historian in Norway. It was probably the most outspoken supporter of Jewish emancipation during the period between the 1814 Constitution and the ultimate emancipation in 1851. Unfortunately, he died in 1845, so he never lived to see that happen. But he's also very much a national hero in Norway for reasons extending far beyond the scope of the Jewish community. And there are a bunch of celebrations where different groups of people pay respect to his grave, and for the Jewish community, that's every 17th of May. And now for my biggest mistake in the video. Finland was in fact the aggressor in the continuation war and actively sought out help from Nazi Germany. As with the Baltic states, the Soviet gains in the Winter War had never been recognized by the Western Allies, so they thought they could get away with it, and there was some hardcore selling out involved. Another correction, Sweden isn't the only country in the world where Yiddish holds official status at a national level. 
The relevant language in the Council of Europe has also been adopted by the Netherlands, Romania, Poland, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. That last one is weird, since as far as I know, Yiddish was never commonly spoken there. If any Judeo-elect is associated with Bosnia, it's Ladino. And of course, during the Russian Civil War, it was also an official language of the Ukrainian People's Republic. Gaon-level patron Jordan Gorelkin asks, What was the most interesting fact that you learned while researching for this video? To be honest, uh, I don't have an answer to that question. I'd intended to make this special for a very long time, like multiple years, and when I actually started researching, none of the new information particularly jumped out at me, so I'm sorry to disappoint you. Gaon level patron Zach S asks, Do we have any samples or writings of the Danish Low German Pigeon that Jews of 17th and 18th century Denmark wrote? In terms of real world uses of it, probably, but you'd have to dig deep into Danish government archives or old records of the Jewish community there. In terms of mass media, there are obviously those five plays that Holberg wrote between 1723 and 1728, albeit I don't speak Danish, and I was unable to find out which plays from that period include Jewish dialogue. He wrote more than five plays within that time period. He was very prolific. Navi level patron Saul Cohn asks, what, if any, news is there from Greenland? There is none. I was unable to find any information regarding a Jewish population in Greenland, and in all likelihood it doesn't have one. I was referred via the comment section to some information about the 12 Jews of the Faroe Islands, but I was unable to confirm any of it, except that one of them is the musician Mikhail Black. And that's the recap for Scandinavia. I'll see you soon as we dive into Palestine in the 1920s. Special thanks to my patrons, including Mir Akbar Ali, Jeremy Biskin, Boris Cherney, FC, Matthew Feinberg, Jay Fleischman, Osher Gordon, Bob Huddy, Raphael Kellerman, Sol Cohn, Jacob Kossoff, Eric Liederman, and Jeffrey Schweitzer.